Hello from Widener University, Delaware Law School. I'm Mary Allen, the Public Relations Officer, with the fall tradition where our faculty preview big cases coming for the Supreme Court in the new term. This year, we have five professors and our law dean giving brief discussions of cases that raise interesting legal questions on things like race and sentencing, government funding for religious organizations, and smartphone design rights, among others. This program is intended to assist members of the media as they determine how and whether to cover cases before the court. Our faculty make excellent expert commentators and are available to serve as expert sources in news stories. You're free to use these videos, share them, or reach out to faculty for personal interviews using the contact information on your screen at the end. Our law dean, Rod Smola, gets things started by discussing some big picture ideas of what it means for the court to begin the term with just eight justices. Let's begin. I'm Rod Smola, the Dean of the Delaware Law School. One of the most interesting things about this year's Supreme Court term is that, again, the court will operate with only eight justices. And that will have a big impact on how the court operates and what some of the outcomes will be. When you think about the significance of a court operating with one of the seats vacant, uh, we have to distinguish between those cases that implicate big ideological splits in constitutional law or in our country's culture, and those cases that are very important but don't, the kinds of cases that don't generally divide along any particular ideological or philosophical lines. As to that second kind of case, the sort of pure legal disputes that don't really implicate culture wars or big theories about how we should interpret the Constitution, it doesn't matter that much that the court has only eight justices. Uh, it's still possible that those cases would end in a deadlock of four to four, uh, but that's sort of random, and there's no reason particularly to think that would happen more often than not. But where it does matter, uh, is that the court, of course, traditionally often takes as a major part of its docket giant big picture issues that shape the identity of our country and the future of our constitutional law. And those cases often do divide along conservative and liberal lines. And this year, again, that divide is enormously important. And the fact that there are only eight justices will have a great deal to do with how the court operates. For virtually my entire lifetime as a lawyer and a constitutional law scholar, for decades, for as long as I can remember, the Supreme Court of the United States has been very closely divided between liberals and conservatives. There's typically been three or four liberal members of the court, three or four conservative members of the court, and one or two people in the middle. For a long time, the two middle justices were Justice O'Connor and Justice Kennedy. And Justice O'Connor often controlled the outcome of close cases. In more recent years, it's been Justice Kennedy that has uh, controlled the outcome of close cases. Well, this year, we now have four liberal justices on the court, uh, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, and Justice Breyer, and three reliably conservative justices on the court, Justices Alito and Thomas, and Chief Justice Roberts. And that puts, again, Justice Kennedy in that critical middle role. But as you can tell, there's an asymmetry. For the liberals, they need to try to sway Justice Kennedy to get a victory. For the conservatives, they need to try to uh, sway Justice Kennedy just to get a tie. And so this will tend, I think, to discourage the court from taking many uh, big, hot-button, large constitutional law questions. Uh, I doubt we'll see as many of those on the docket, and I doubt we'll see any resolution until after the presidential contests and after the nomination of a new person on the seat and after a confirmation by the Senate and we finally get up to full staffing. There are, however, still already on the docket a number of fascinating cases, and I'm going to talk to you about one of them, a patent case, an intellectual property case involving a battle between Apple and Samsung. If you put Apple versus Samsung into any search engine, you'll almost have a meltdown of your computer because they have been litigating against one another all over the world for years over their various intellectual property rights. 
This particular case is a design patent case involving smartphones in which Apple has sued Samsung claiming that Samsung infringed its design patent with regard to its iPhone products. Now a design patent is different from a utility patent. A utility patent deals with how a machine actually functions, how a, how an, an, a device actually works. A design patent, though, is kind of an unusual element of intellectual property. It's sort of in the netherworld that spills over into things like trade dress and trademark and copyright law. It doesn't deal with how my iPhone or a Samsung smartphone works. It deals with what it looks like, how it's designed. And in the early years, in the 19th century, when the Supreme Court first began to look at design patents, it said, yes, there is such a thing as a design patent infringement, but when it happens, you really don't get much in the way of damages, because all you've done is take the way something looks and sort of copied it in a way that infringes on the patent. Congress intervened and overruled those line of Supreme Court cases, and it wrote a statute that said that when you win a design patent case, you are entitled to recover your total profit. Well, in the case of a smartphone, we're talking about about half a billion dollars in total profits that Samsung allegedly owes Apple because it took elements of the design of Apple's phone. Now, when I say elements of the design, I mean things pretty simple in many ways, it's like the way this phone is curved, the way the frame looks, the way the interface looks, the kind of thing that we deal with when we play with our phone and, and, and use it. Samsung argues that it should not have to pay all of the profits that it has made on its smartphones, but only those parts that are, are attributable to the design. So if you think about it, if you buy a Samsung phone, how much of your decision to buy it is based on its look and how much is based on its function? If you think about it in those terms, maybe the damages are not as high as the disgorging of all of Samsung's profits. The Supreme Court will decide whether or not the statute should be literally interpreted, in which case Apple will get all of Samsung's profits uh, from its uh, smartphone uh, manufacturer, or whether it should be more nuanced and limited to those parts of the infringement that you can trace more directly to the design itself. The one thing I can assure you is that in the modern age, when the Supreme Court decides that case, you and me will first learn about it through some alert that we'll see on our smartphones. Hi, my name is John Culhane, and I'm the H. Albert Young Fellow in Constitutional Law and a professor at the Delaware Law School. And what I'm going to be talking to you about for the next couple of minutes is the issue of transgender rights, as I think it may play out not only this year in the Supreme Court, but sort of looking a little further down the road. In the wake of the Obergefell decision of uh, 2014, which gave same-sex couples the right to marry, uh, the attention really has moved away from gay and lesbian couples more to the rights of uh, transgendered people. And I think over the next few years, we're going to see all kinds of uh, legal arguments and sort of social arguments or societal arguments going on around issues like trans partic participation in sex segregated sports, uh, trans, uh, trans individuals in the workplace, and of course the issue we all know to be the flashpoint, which is uh, whether trans people should have access to uh, public bathrooms that are consistent with their gender identity that they choose or whether that's determined by their uh, biological sex. So we're probably all familiar with the case from North Carolina involving House Bill 2, which basically says that all people in North Carolina uh, must use the bathroom that's consistent with their biological sex. Uh, that case has been pushed a little bit to the side because there's a case right now uh, that the Supreme Court may consider I may decide to take up this fall uh, that comes out of Virginia. And the case is called GG, those are initials, GG versus Gloucester County School Board. Uh, so let me tell you what happened in that case and uh, what's at stake when it gets to the Supreme Court. GG is uh, the initials for a kid named Gavin Grimm, who is now a senior in a public high school in Virginia. And he was born uh, female, but now identifies as male. That's been his consistent gender identity. 
and the school officials were initially quite willing to work with him to change his name, to change his identity, to uh, treat him as male until uh, he wanted to use the uh, a boys' bathroom. And then people found out about this. It became a huge issue in front of the uh, school board with people testifying uh, in, in sometimes not very nice terms about, about this kid. And so the school board passed a resolution that said that uh, kids must use the bathroom that's consistent with their biological sex, uh, sex rather than their uh, chosen sex, their uh, gender identity. And the question, really, the legal question is, who gets to decide what Gavin Grimm's sex is? Is it Gavin and the Department of Education, which is on his side, or is it the school board? Uh, and he, with the backing of the Department of Education, has challenged the school board in a case that went all the way to the Federal Court of Appeals, uh, which held that the definition of sex that the Department of Education favors, which basically says that uh, one's sex is uh, consistent with one's gender identity, is the sex that uh, uh, governs, not the biological sex. And what the Federal Court of Appeals said is that since the term sex is not defined in the federal law, uh, that the Department of Education had the discretion to define it in the way that it did. And by the federal law in this case, I'm talking about Title IX of the Federal Civil Rights Act, which applies to equality in the educational setting. And uh, what the uh, federal court said is that when we think about Title IX, we usually think about you know, sports, where we think about educational opportunities for boys and girls. What the Department of Education said and what the court agreed with is that we think about sex, that term is broad enough to include gender identity. And the way not to discriminate against Gavin is to let him, uh, let him choose his gender identity. And in this case, that gender identity is male. Uh, the case was uh, appealed to the Supreme Court uh, filed a petition for cert, uh, and now we'll see whether the court will take up the case. Uh, the Supreme Court decided a few months ago that it was going to stay the relief that was requested by uh, Mr. Grimm and his attorneys. And so for now, he's not allowed to use the boys' bathroom. He's using a gender-neutral bathroom, and the Supreme Court may or may not decide to take up this case, may or may not decide to grant certiorari in this case, um, I think there are two outcomes possible. If the court does take the case up, we'll have a clarification of what sex means, not only potentially for Title IX, but throughout the federal civil rights laws, talking about things like employment and public accommodations. If the court decides not to take up the case, then we're going to continue to have these state-by-state -state skirmishes over what sex means and who gets to make that determination. So I'm keeping a close eye not only on this case, but on a whole wide range of cases that involve uh, questions of equality for the trans community. Thank you. I'm Professor Judy Ritter, and I'm going to talk about the case of Buck versus Davis. The Supreme Court's going to hear oral argument during, oral argument during its first week for the new term. This is a case from Texas. It involves a double, double homicide conviction and death sentence. And the case, the legal issue that the Supreme Court is going to review is almost a tangled morass of procedural questions, federal criminal procedure, state criminal procedure, about whether Mr. Buck has the right to appeal certain negative rulings. But at the heart of those questions, it is an astounding set of facts. At Mr. Buck's trial, the jury that was to determine whether to sentence him to life or death heard testimony from a psychologist who was certified by the court as an expert that he was more likely to be dangerous in the future because he was black. Mr. Buck is African American, and at his trial, the jury heard testimony that because statistically, according to this psychologist, African Americans are overrepresented in the prisons, that that was one factor that suggested he might be violent in the future. 
In death penalty trials in Texas and in many places, there's a separate phase where they decide what the sentence should be after conviction. And in Texas, an important factor is what they call future dangerousness. And it's not uncommon for experts to testify for both sides as to their opinion based on interviewing the defendant and many other factors as to whether the person's likely to be violent in the future. That if they sentence them to life, will they be a violent person and put the prison community at risk? In Mr. Buck's case, as I said, the psychologist testified that because of his race, that was one strike against him in terms of future violence. What else is astounding about it is that that psychologist was actually called by the defense. Mr. Buck's lawyers put this witness on the stand. Now, interestingly, after Mr. Buck's trial, the attorney general for the state of Texas announced that this type of testimony had been received in about six cases in Texas, the same type of opinion about race, and that they were conceding that it was unconstitutional, it was inserted a racial bias into the trial that had no place in the criminal justice system, and that they were going to agree to a new penalty trial for the people with whom this, this had an effect on their case. They went ahead and followed that Rule, that decision that they made in every case except for Dwayne Buck's case. They have fought Mr. Buck's quest to get a new sentencing hearing without this kind of testimony. So what does Texas say? Well, the Texas government, the prosecution in this case argues that they admit this is not proper testimony, it's highly prejudicial, it's against the Constitution, but they say in Mr. Buck's case it didn't really matter that they claimed that there was so much evidence that he would be a risk of dangerousness in the future, that this one piece of evidence, this piece of testimony, which was also not only testified to by the witness, but argued by the prosecution in their closing argument, that race was a factor in whether or not he'd be dangerous, that it just didn't really make much of a difference because there were so many additional pieces of evidence about future dangerousness. And so there was likely no significant impact on the jury. Mr. Buck's lawyers dispute that vigorously. They say that, in fact, the evidence of future dangerousness was pretty slim and that this was likely, therefore, to have had a really strong impact, or at least the risk that there was, and therefore Mr. Buck should be able to argue not only that this was highly prejudicial and didn't belong in the case, but that his lawyers were ineffective for putting such a witness on the stand. And really, whether he'll get his day in court about this issue is at the heart of the procedural questions that the court's going to take. So, this, as I said, there's a morass of procedural issues here that the court is going to have to debate, and I'm sure the oral argument will address many of these issues. But ultimately, the court's going to have to decide whether to let a man be executed in the face of having testimony like this in the transcript where a jury was invited to consider his race as a factor in whether he should be put to death. And especially in today's climate where racial bias in our criminal justice system is really at the forefront of a lot of discussion about our system and whether it should be reformed, and there are many reform efforts, I think the Supreme Court's going to be taking it very seriously, the real meaning of how they rule on some of these procedural questions. The Supreme Court did turn down Mr. Buck when he asked for review in the past, a few years back, a couple of things have changed since then. A couple of cases have been decided by the Supreme Court that support Mr. Buck's procedural arguments. And Justice Scalia, who voted against review for him in the past, of course, is no longer on the court. So there's certainly room here for the Supreme Court to give Mr. Buck his day in court um, and decide that this is an important issue that he should be able to get a full hearing on. I am Professor Alan Garfield at Delaware Law School. I want to speak to you briefly about Trinity Lutheran Church versus Pauley. Trinity Lutheran Church is a church in Columbia, Missouri that owns and operates a preschool. The preschool is open to kids of all religions, of all, ki of all kinds of kids but it does teach Christian values and its curriculum is infused with religious education. Polly is Sarah Polly, who is the director of the Missouri Department of Natural Resources. Now, 
Missouri has a program where, where organizations could apply for grants from the Department of Natural Resources to get recycled tire material that can be used to resurface playgrounds. It's good for the environment, it gets rid of these tires, and it's good for the kids who fall off the monkey bars because it's a softer, rubbery surface. Now, 44 organizations applied for these grants, including the preschool at Trinity Church. Uh, under the criteria Missouri used, Trinity Church's application was ranked fifth, and Missouri gave out 14 grants. So you might have thought that Trinity would have gotten one of these grants, but they didn't. And the reason they didn't, according to Missouri, was because Missouri is not allowed to give public funds to religious institutions. And specifically, the Missouri Constitution says, no money shall ever be taken from the public treasury, directly or indirectly, in aid of any church, section, or denomination. So they said, sorry, we can't give money to your preschool because it's part of a church. This case comes at the intersection of the two religion clauses in the First Amendment. The first clause is the Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. The Establishment Clause says government is not supposed to be favoring, benefiting, funding, aiding, endorsing religion. And so Missouri is saying we can't give money to Trinity Church because government money is not supposed to go to church activities. On the other side is the Free Exercise Clause. The Free Exercise Clause says Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. That clause teaches us that government is not supposed to be discriminating against disfavoring religious institutions, burdening religious practice. So, and, and so Lutheran is saying, you are discriminating against us. You know, all the other organizations are allowed to get this grant for, for resurfacing, but not us, the religious institutions. So how should it play out? And mind you, the First Amendment now applies to state and local governments, so it applies to Missouri. The argument in favor of Missouri is to say, if you look at the history of the Establishment Clause, it was all about objections to taxpayer money going to religious institutions. Uh, it, the concern is that if churches get money from the government, they be, become dependent on the government, uh, and it's going to corrupt the churches because the government is going to have control over them. It's going to create religious divisiveness. If you have the church, the synagogue, and the mosque all applying for this grant, and guess what? Just the church gets it, it's going to look like it's going to create divisiveness between the groups. On the other side, <coughs> however, is the argument from Trinity saying, this is not government money for Bibles. It's not government money for the minister. It's not government money for religious teachers. This is government money for a playground surface. It's totally secular. And to not allow us to participate in the program is discrimination against religion. It's as if, if, the, if the Mississippi River flooded a block in St. Louis and a pizza parlor, a t-shirt store, and a small storefront church were flooded, and Missouri said, here's money to help pump out the water. And Missouri would say, the pizza parlor could get the money, the t-shirt store could get the money, but not the church because we can't give any money. That's discrimination against religion. This is not about secular government money going towards religion. And so therefore, the argument on one side is to say government money can't go to religious activities. The, go, the, the argument on the other side is this is purely money for purely secular purposes, and this is treating religion worse than everybody else and is violating the free exercise clause. How will the case come out? 
It's hard to know. A lot of church and state cases have split 5-4. Scalia oftentimes was the judge who gave five votes, ruling usually in favor of the religious uh, interest. He's not on the court anymore, so it could largely depend on who's elected the next president. Thank you for listening. Hello, I'm Professor Mary Bridget McManaman. You may be familiar with my research in the area of natural born citizenship. Today I'm here to talk to you about a case before the Supreme Court that implicates citizenship uh, yet again. The case is Lynch, as in Attorney General Loretta Lynch, versus Morales Santana. Mr. Morales Santana was born outside of the United States to an American father and a non-American mother. Unfortunately for him, his parents were not married at the time of his birth, and that had implications for whether he would become naturalized at birth. It turns out that if his mother had been the American, all he would have required was that she live in the United States for a year before his birth. Because it was his father who was the American, the father had to live not only 10 years in the United States, but also five of those years at the, after his 14th birthday. Unfortunately, Mr. Santana's father left the United States 20 days before he had completed that. So he was not eligible under the current statute. Mr. Morales Santana is challenging the statute, claiming that it violates the equal protection guarantees of the Fifth Amendment. The issues are beginning with whether or not there is any control over Congress's ability to, to decide who can or who cannot be naturalized. The Attorney General is taking the position that there is absolutely no limit on Congress's ability to say we're excluding you and not including you. Um, but the argument is that because there's a difference based on whether your mother is the American or your father is the American, that there's an equal protection problem. The first question that the court's going to have to address is, do they buy the Attorney General that there's total deference given to Congress, or do they apply the heightened scrutiny for gender discrimination cases? The Second Circuit said, have to use heightened scrutiny, and it seems to me that the Attorney General is on weak ground there. She's relying on a 1970s case that has been distinguished since several times by the United States Supreme Court. So, the government is going to have to establish that there was a substantial governmental interest in distinguishing between unwed mothers and unwed fathers, and in addition that its method is uh, substantially related to that goal. The, the uh, uh, Attorney General has two arguments. One, that there has to be a connection between the United States and the citizen, and that that's an important governmental interest. For example, if my daughter were to move to Ireland and settle there and have a child, that child would be American. But if that child went on staying in Ireland and had a child herself, the, the connection between the United States would be too attenuated for citizenship. So the question is, is the requirement that the parent live in the United States important to have a connection with the United States? I think that there's no question that it is. The Second Circuit clearly found that it was, and uh, the, the respondent is not arguing that it is not important. Um, the question, though, is, is the 10-year requirement substantially related to that goal? And it seems to me that the government is on weak grounds there because the, um, uh, it, why would it only take one year to make that connection for a mom, but 10 years for a dad to make that connection? So I think that they're going to lose on that. The second governmental interest is that you don't want stateless children. And this one is a stronger argument for the government. What you don't want is to have a mom who's an American give birth overseas in a country that recognizes birth by citizenship, not by soil. That is, let's say an American mom gives birth in France. In France, that child is not French because her mother is not French. So that if you don't immediately allow a mother to have that connection, you might end up with a stateless baby who's neither an American because not born here, nor French because without a French parent. That's different in the case of a father who would legitimate later down in the road. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I suspect that the government is going to lose on the first. They may have a better chance on the second. Hello, I'm Bruce Groskal. I'm the Helen S. Balick Visiting Professor of Business Bankruptcy Law at the Delaware Law School. I'm going to talk today about a case before the Supreme Court called Jevic Holding Corp. Uh, the Supreme Court will decide this fall in Jevic whether the absolute priority rule in bankruptcy applies to the ch structured dismissal of a Chapter 11 bankruptcy case. Uh, the case arose from a 2014 decision of Chief Judge Brendan Shannon of the Delaware Bankruptcy Court 
approving a structured dismissal uh, in JEVIC. A structured dismissal, in essence, is a settlement among the debtor and certain creditors in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy case that resolves the case other than by a reorganization plan. In most cases uh, that are resolved by a structured dismissal, a plan is not confirmable uh, because simply the secured creditors have a lien in all or substantially all of the debtor's remaining property, uh, so there's no money or assets left with which to propose and confirm a plan. Uh, under a plain vanilla one-sentence dismissal order uh, of a Chapter 11 case, uh, unlike a plain vanilla one-sentence dismissal order of a Chapter 11 case, an order approving a structured dismissal typically contains the substantive settlement terms agreed by the parties. Those terms may include a release of claims, an agreed gifting of the funding for the settlement by secured creditors from their collateral, and procedures for reconciling and paying certain claims. When a structured settlement runs up against the absolute priority rule, however, um, problems might arise under the bankruptcy code. The absolute priority rule in bankruptcy has been described by some as the cornerstone of Chapter 11. Uh, in those circumstances to which the rule applies, it requires that holders of junior claims and shares in the company be paid nothing until all senior claims are paid in full. Thus, for example, if a class of priority unsecured creditors has voted to reject a Chapter 11 plan, under which plan the holders in that class will not be paid in full, then junior stakeholders such as general unsecured creditors and shareholders can't receive anything under the plan. The petitioners in JEVIC are WARN Act claimants former employees who asserted claims on the ground that they did not receive a 60-day advance warning of a mass layoff by the debtor. The structured dismissal in JEVIC was not in accordance with the absolute priority rule because it paid nothing on the Priority Warrant Act claims, but made a small distribution to general unsecured creditors who were junior claimants. The Warrant Act employees were not parties to the ultimate settlement because they could not reach that agreement for the release of the claims that they also asserted against the secured creditor who was funding the settlement. In Judge Shannon's uh, words, he did not see how that secured creditor would possibly want to fund litigation against itself. The district court in Jevic affirmed Judge Shannon's decision, as did the Third Circuit, by a two to one vote. The Warren Act claimants sought and obtained certiorari based on a circuit court split on the issue. Uh, the question before the Supreme Court in Jevic is, whether a bankruptcy court may authorize the distribution of settlement proceeds that violates the statutory priority scheme. Critics claim that structured dismissals are nothing more than an end run around the absolute priority rule. They assert that the absolute priority rule is considered sacrosanct in bankruptcy law. They say that reordering the priorities through, quote, the alchemy, end quote, of a structured dismissal lacks textual, textual support in the code and is contrary to a congressional policy that favors the absolute priority rule. They argue that the bankruptcy court, instead of approving such a structured dismissal, must convert the case to Chapter 7 and let the trustee distribute the remaining assets in accordance with the absolute priority rule. The alternative uh, to a structured dismissal, unfortunately, will often be that all unsecured creditors will receive nothing. Uh, the bankruptcy court in Jevic made that finding concluding that even the objecting Warren Act claims would be out of the money if the case converted to Chapter 7. The court described the structured dismissal that it approved as the least bad alternative when compared with a nihilistic exercise that would result in nothing for any unsecured creditor. Several aspects of this case bear consideration. First, uh, the bankruptcy code leaves the approval of settlements such as the one reached in Jevic to the reasonable discretion of the bankruptcy courts and does not expressly require compliance with the absolute priority rule. Second, the bankruptcy code expressly provides that when considering whether to dismiss a case or, con or to convert it to chapter seven, the court should make its determination based on the best interest of creditors and says nothing of absolute priority in that context. Third, the absolute priority rule is not the cornerstone rule of bankruptcy law that critics of structured dismissals say it is. The term does not, in fact, appear in the text of the code at all. Uh, further, Congress over the last 60 years repeatedly has limited the reach of absolute priority 
uh, by, or the reach of the absolute priority rule by a series of express congressional enactments. As a result, for example, the absolute priority rule under the present code does not even apply to dissenters under a consensual Chapter 11 plan, which a majority in each class has voted to accept, and also does not generally apply to plans for municipalities, family farmers, or individual wage earners under other chapters of the bankruptcy code. The key to the Jevic decision below was that a plan could not be confirmed and approval of the structured dismissal was the least bad alternative. The key to the Supreme Court's determination of the Jevic case may be the extent to which the court concludes, notwithstanding the negative arc of legislative enactments and the absence of text supporting their position, that the bankruptcy code reflects a congressional policy that favors the absolute priority rule in Chapter 11 even if the result is that unsecured creditors otherwise will receive nothing. Thank you.